Welcome to another edition of Official Insights Modernizing Government, an interview series with government officials tasked with making services to the public more accessible and efficient, particularly as it pertains to payments. This series is presented by our partners at American Express. I'm your host, Joe McKeating with Grant Street Group. Joining me today is Jose Cisneros, treasurer for the city and county of San Francisco. Jose, welcome. Great to be here. I think it might be helpful, Jose, for viewers, if we began by you giving a little bit of an introduction about what it is the treasurer's office does here in San Francisco. Sure, happy to. Um, the treasurer's office is basically the city's banker and investment manager for all the funds of the city and county of San Francisco. Probably one of the biggest responsibilities we have is to collect over 180 different types of taxes and fees. Um, that involves us bringing in millions of payments of those amounts of funds um, for those taxes and fees, and it accumulates to five, six billion dollars a year or more. Um, and so it's a large responsibility, and it takes a lot of work to, keep, to get all that done right. Once we bring that money in, we're in charge of managing, managing through our bank accounts and investing the funds and keeping them safe. And we're, we're, we're managing the short-term funds for the city and county of San Francisco. The average daily balances for that is around 11 or $12 billion lately. Uh, and we put that in only the very safest of uh, investments. We want to make sure every uh, taxpayer dollar is kept safe and available for what is needed for uh, to fund the good work of the city and county government. And in the past year, which was obviously a historic year, um, accelerated a lot of changes. What did you see change in terms of the processes that had to go on in your office? Wow, the changes we uh, undertook during the pandemic uh, is a very long list. Um, when uh, the pandemic locked everything down, um, all of our staff, uh, of course, uh, began to work from home. Um, but nevertheless, the responsibility of our office continued. We had to bring in, uh, as I said, those billions of dollars of revenue that allows the city and county to, to do its work. Um, many of, of, the, of, the, of the services we provide in, in terms of tax collection is, is actually even done um, by interfacing with people in person. And one of the things we had to uh, figure out was how to engage with our taxpayers and make sure that they had the ability to meet their obligations, interface with us, um, send in their payments, but of course, stay safe uh, themselves and allow us to let our employees and, and, and stay safe. So uh, that was really interesting. Um, probably one of the first and foremost things that we did was we worked with our government leaders to understand the impacts uh, that our taxpayers were experiencing, which were, as we all know, numerous. So we did things like look at our, our tax scheduled deadline payments, and for many of them, probably even most of them, we actually pushed them out to a later date because we knew that many businesses were experiencing real hard impacts, financial impacts. And, and they weren't bringing in revenue. And we wanted to make sure they had every chance to be financially successful and be able to survive uh, the difficulties they were experiencing during the pandemic. So week after week, month after month, we worked with government leaders and kept uh, pushing out uh, deadlines. Nevertheless, a number of deadlines did still occur even during lockdown, even during the pandemic, and continue to this day. Um, one, one story I like to tell is that every year we collect property taxes, like every county in the state of California and probably across the entire country. And we bring in, we collect each year upwards of $3.3 billion in payments in property taxes. Um, we have um, a couple hundred thousand, over a couple hundred thousand parcels. So that's how many bills we're collecting at two different uh, due dates during the year. And while most people will mail in those payments or pay them online. Uh, just as, as recently as uh, December of 2019, we had 17,000 people actually walk into our offices, physically walk into our offices here in City Hall and make their payments at our cashier windows in person. Well, certainly during the pandemic, we weren't interested and for the sake of all of the safety of our taxpayers, we didn't want to see them leaving their lockdown uh, safe homes 
and, and feeling like they had to show up in person. So we really pivoted. We really reached out. We communicated in, in multiple languages. We made sure everybody knew they were completely able to meet all their obligations and make their payments remotely, safely, from home. So whether that meant mailing it in or going online, um, we really wanted to make sure everybody knew uh, there was a possibility for them to stay safe and still meet their obligations. We were particularly concerned about many of our more older taxpayers, who many of them were more comfortable, honestly, coming in in person and walking up to an, a, 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 a real cashier and, and having an interaction and walking out with a, a receipt generated as soon as they made their payment. We, we particularly reached out to folks, and again, to make sure they were aware. And that, that so by comparison, that 17,000 number of folks we had come in in person in December of 2019, in December of 2020, we had 138 people come in and make a payment in person. So we felt we really successfully reached uh, nearly everybody that we wanted to, to make sure they understood they could stay safe, they could stay healthy, uh, but still have the opportunity uh, to meet their obligations and make their payments. How do you go about ensuring that there's still that human touch uh, at the end of the day with something that can be, if done wrong, as impersonal as uh, technology sometimes? Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, I think it really comes down to having um, really informative communication wrapped around the technology that we're incorporated. We certainly want to work with all of our partners our systems partners, our city partners, and our outside um, partners to make sure that we're doing, making things as easy as possible for people to be able to go onto our website, um, print out a bill, um, look up what they owe, understand their situation, their obligations, and the deadlines, and then understand quickly and easily, here were their options for uh, paying remotely. For some, for some, taxes, we actually will mail out a bill, like property taxes. We know who the, 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 the taxpayers are. We know what their, what their owed amount is. We put together bills like everyone else. We mail them out. They have a coupon inside, a return envelope. Uh, they can easily do it that way. Also, though, in mu multiple languages, we have instructions there on how to do it online um, or whatever they might prefer. Um, for other taxes, it's, it's not quite as obvious. We don't have the information to say. There are many of our taxes that we, we put onto businesses, and we may not know who started a business in the last 12 months. So we don't have the opportunity to, to send them a reminder, or, uh, you know, let them know about a deadline that's coming up. And so we rely on them um, you know, learning things through our website, learning things through folks that are helping them start their business but making sure that they have a good and easy to understand landing page to come to with us that says, here's how you register your business with us, here's how you pay your taxes, here's what the deadlines are and your obligations, and by the way, here's the changes we've made during the pandemic to make things a little easier, to give you more time uh, to be able to meet your obligations. And with some of these numbers about how many people came into the office, uh, how many taxes you collect, uh, these numbers are clearly so familiar with you, which makes me think that you probably take a pretty data-informed approach to making these decisions. Could you talk a little bit about your approach to that? Absolutely. It's important for us to always stay as, in, as informed as we can be about how successful we're being at engaging with our taxpayers, certainly because we want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity uh, to pay their obligations. Um, people think that, you know, we're all about just bringing the money in and that's all we care about. The truth of the matter is, um, if somebody misses an obligation, there is, uh, you know, there is a mandatory penalty which just increases the financial burden. So one of the obligations we really take to heart is letting people know when the deadline is because oftentimes, you know, missing a deadline might be just be an oversight or, or uh, uh, something forgotten. And there's, it's really unfortunate when we have to see the, the amount owed be increased for something that could have easily been avoided. And it's really important to make sure they have the opportunity to plan uh, for what they owe, understand what their obligations are, being able to meet them financially while being able to succeed and not go under. Do you see a future where everything or almost everything that can be done in person at a treasurer's office 
could be done online or on mobile if the customer wanted to do it that way? We're certainly striving for that. We, we, we've gotten to the point where nearly everything that people do with us, whether it's filing a tax return, opening up a business and creating and making themselves known to us and creating themselves as an entity in our city, all of that is able to be done electronically online. And we were clear that we wanted to make sure it could even happen on a, on a mobile device because we know a lot of people um, are, 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 are limited perhaps in their technological um, devices or their channels. And, and the fact of the matter is, while we each year have about 100,000 businesses registered in our, in our city and county of San Francisco, the majority of those are actually small businesses and many of them are one person sole proprietors. Well, a one person sole proprietor doesn't have an IT department, doesn't have uh, support, doesn't have, frankly, all that much time to come up to speed on how uh, to do things. So it really was incumbent on us to make things as you all interfaces as easy and logical and understandable as possible. And when you are more open to doing things online like that, how do you go about evaluating the success? Is it based on surveying, testimonials, or what? Uh, we do a lot of surveying. We try oftentimes to find out and learn as much about what impact we've had or what responses uh, we can learn from the actions we've taken. Um, certainly, if we're having a basic income project where we're reaching out to you know, 50 or 100 or, or, or even 500 people and, and giving them some supplements, we have a feedback loop built into that so we can understand what kind of impacts are we making, how are the funds being used, in, a, in an appropriate and non-invasive way, obviously, but you know, what kind of differences were we able to make? Because we want to evaluate whether this is something we should continue doing, grow the field of people we're doing it for, whatever. At the same time, even when we're doing, you know, our more, our more long-standing business of collecting taxes and all that, we're trying to incorporate feedback loops so that we can ask people, how did this go for you? Um, most of the time when people aren't happy, they are not shy about letting us know. We have a very, uh, it's very easy for people to reach us either through email or uh, by calling the city's one single customer service number, 311, on their telephone. And we do get a lot of feedback there. Our 311 system here is, is completely wonderful. It's 24 hours a day in, I forget the number, 50 plus different languages that people can converse with with a representative, um, our, our, the operator, the, call, the person that talks to the caller can answer the overwhelming majority of questions that they have because most people have fairly simple um, questions. They just need to know what's my deadline or how do I pay or something like that. For more advanced questions, the, their question will get uh, sent over to our office and we'll get back to them like within a day, maybe same day, um, so they can have uh, the answers they need. Uh, I'm really proud of the way we've been able to, to use technology and better, smarter systems to be more responsive and do our job better. I think San Francisco has long had the world around, the, the, the reputation for being such a technology hub. Do, do you think that puts additional expectations on government when you're in such a tech hub to be a, a tech forward uh, government as well? Um, we certainly are, uh, your point's well taken, we certainly are surrounded by a lot of citizenry here who are very advanced, very educated, and in their daily lives, using um, many times very cutting edge technology. And I have to confess, I have heard once or twice that they feel like uh, that some of the systems or procedures we use might be a little old fashioned, or a little uh, outdated. But I'm actually more proud of the fact that as we have continued to improve our systems and seen other departments do the same, we've gotten pos very positive responses. And, and more often than not, um, we've heard people give us feedback that said, you know, I, they really liked the way we made it easier for them to get their obligations met, ways for them to work with the city, even get sometimes assistance from the city in ways that were easy and comfortable for them. What about with uh, basic income and that idea, pursuing a, a, a program like that, would these, be, would these payments be mailed? Would they be direct deposit? How would technology play a role in that? Well, that's an excellent question. And those are exactly the things we're trying to figure out. What we found is that when you're doing something like giving someone um, wage replacement funds, 
um, uh, funds to pay for food, whatever the case may be, timeliness is really important. You can't go to someone and say, I'm going to give you $500. I promise you it'll be here in a week or 10 days. I mean, people have needs today. People have needs right now. And they need to have access to funds immediately. And so it was important for us to be able to use things like technology and, and, and advanced financial products to be able to load funds, to be able to administer those funds and get them to the people that needed, while at the same time protecting against any fraud or, or any kind of um, malfeasance that we don't want to see happen. That's not why we're putting these systems in place. We want to be responsible with public funds, but we want to do it in a way that can help the people that need the help the most. So we were able to find a technology as well as financial products that we could marry together, then perhaps wrap around with some education, some coaching, and some support so that we could actually get um, things that people needed to them in a fast and timely fashion. And just to wrap up the conversation here, are there any other initiatives that your office is working on? We've talked about the financial empowerment, but anything else that you're excited about or proud of that you'd like to talk about before we wrap up here? We always knew that there were systemic differences in the way people experienced our city, their jobs, um, all sorts of things. And, and, and we saw systemic racism. We saw very dramatic differences by gender, by class, by, by race, all sorts of things like that. We've known about that for a long time. What we didn't know necessarily is how we could break through some of those barriers. How could we have those conversations and how could we try some different ways of approaching those imbalances to try different things to see what we could do to, to, more, to, more, to improve the situation. And as I talked about with the, with the basic income projects, taking the things we learned, taking the tools we developed during the pandemic, and now being able to um, deploy them as we reach out to a particular low income community, um, and, and, and particularly needy folks in our community and saying, can we see if what we were able to do, how we were able to pivot and how we were able to reach people quickly in a crisis can be something we start to incorporate and we do on a regular basis with the people again that need our help the most. And I'm excited that, you know, in partnership with our financial education um, experience and the development of the tools that we've, we've enabled, and our, our growing understanding of the inequality in our communities and the need to find ways to combat that are, are things we're excited to, challenges we're exciting to tackle. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. Jose, I'd really like to thank you for joining me on this edition of Official Insights Modernizing Government. Thank you, it's great to be here.